Hi everyone, welcome to Resilience Unraveled. This podcast is the result of my fascination with subjects like resilience, accountability, burnout, life fulfillment and other life and work based performance issues, as well as many of the other obsessions I bump into in my life. I spend my time working with highly successful teams, people, and organizations, and this podcast introduces their remarkable stories and expertise, as well as my own synthesis of the key issues, strategies, tips, tools, and resources to thrive in life. If you find this podcast useful, why not go over to our site, qedod.com. If you'd like some resources on how to manage and beat burnout, head to qedod.com forward slash burnout. 2019 for some goodies. Stay tuned to the end to find out details of how to order a free ebook. Enjoy the podcast. And today I'm talking to Dr. Diane Stoller, who's uh, got a fascinating track record and some really, really information, interesting information to impart. So good afternoon, Dr. Diane. Good afternoon. Well, it's afternoon where I am, but I'm I guessing from your accent, you're in the middle of the middle of the morning, are you? That's right. Well, it's almost afternoon. It's uh, close to it. <laughs> oh, very good. Very good. So tell me where you are. I am north of Boston. Yeah. 45 minutes north, but I originated from the middle part of the country. So my accent sounds more Midwestern until I talk to some of my New Englanders here. So I learned how to say aunt instead of aunt. <laughs> We have the same thing. <laughs> so it's fascinating talking about accents and how they work. That's right. Yeah, very interesting. So, um, so tell me a little bit about yourself, Dr. Diane. Well, is that I am a, a neuropsychologist, a board-certified health psychologist. I am also a board-certified sports psychologist ah. and a performing arts psychologist. And uh, I'm my career started... Uh, very interesting because we talk about resilience and change uh, is I started out as a cost accountant. Oh, really? Yes. I was a cost accountant and teaching cost accounting at Stonehill College, which is still uh, north, well, actually south of Boston. And I taught in Boston at Fisher uh, College in uh, Chamberlain. And then I went to, and worked at Tufts University. And then I morphed into special education. Wow. And then I worked for the government, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, in special ed. I was a special ed auditor and a special ed teacher. And I did my doctoral work on autism. And it was the first time in anybody was doing any. It was the first inclusive classroom ever in the United States. Wow. And we did the research and found out how using sign language would help. Yeah. Yeah. And finding out the resilience of these children, given the right tools. Right. And so, and from that, I morphed into, as part of the sports, and I, in 1979, I opened my first private practice, and I've been doing this for now 40 years, yeah. and as part of the practice, I've been a trauma therapist working with post-traumatic stress disorder, incest, rape, and abuse, but also my business background is I work with corporations on human resources and helping them to help people with, at that time, just trauma. And yes. uh, then in 1990, I had a cerebral bleed while driving. Oh, my goodness. I had a 60-mile-an-hour head-on auto accident. Wow. I injured my optic nerve, my t- jaw, four cervical, three thoracic, three lumbar, both my knees, bent my tongue down the middle and my husband when he saw me in the hospital said I always knew I spoke with forked tongue and, <laughs> <laughs> and after four years I was told by every single doctor I was permanently brain damaged wow now be, going back again to the when I opened my practice it was the first in all of New England the first integrative practice I had psychiatrists I had neurologists I had speech and language pathologists I had uh uh, physical therapist, but also had acupuncture, I had massage, and all we had homeopathics. It was the first integrative practice ever in New England. Right. And so at that time, and my approach is a five prong approach. And that five prong approach is looking at the physical yeah. of a person, which yeah. includes their genetics. We're going to talk about that. The emotional, how someone's brought up, psychological means what is the biochemicals 
So if there is uh, serotonin's off, you know, so if there's schizophrenia, there's bipolar or hormonal, yeah. we that has to be addressed. That's psychological. That is yeah. not of the other three. And then there's spiritual, what someone's mm-hmm. belief is. Yeah. And the last is uh, energy, the energy yeah. psychology, which I've been trained in. I was trained, I've been blessed with being trained by Roger Callahan, the first guy who invented the Callahan technique, which is the mm-hmm. tapping technique. Yes. And then it so, so, have, so have I actually, but bizarrely enough, and it's, it has amazing results, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. And yeah. so, and, and then f- more from that is Fred Gallo, who went in his, well, as you know, Roger Callahan went from the Callahan technique to TFT, thought field therapy, and then it morphed into TFT and EFT with yeah. Gary Craig. And then I've trained with uh, Donna Eden, energy psychology, and then I was trained in Bali with energy psychology. So we have in our practice Reiki people. Yes. We have, uh, you know, acupuncture. Uh, on our team, we have Tom Tam, who is world renowned in acupuncture, homeopathics, naturopaths, along with, as I said, all the medical doctors you can think of, and the world renowned water therapist man, Igor Berdenko. He's the guy who helped Nancy Kerrigan recover uh-huh. in the Olympics. And so, I see his patients or his clients, and as one of the jokes here, they always ask, does the shrink have a couch? Yes. I have a seven-foot couch for my NFL players and NBA players, okay? Yes. Yes. And I have in in the gymnasts, too. So I work with Olympic athletes, corporate executives. So when 19, when, and after four years in 1994, when everybody said I was permanently brain damaged, I utilized my own all my methods, and by 19, that was 1994, by 1997, I had put Humpty Dumpty back together and wrote, mm. written the first book ever on concussion called Coping with Mild Traumatic Brain Injury. Right. And so then I was doing really well, and then in 2005 is that um, uh, I got Lyme disease. In New England right. here, there's ticks all over. I got yes. Lyme disease. I was very, very sick. And on our team, we have a nutritional educator right. and using uh, homeopathics and nutrition, recovered from that. Then in 2008, wow. I was driving and another a snow plow took off the front of my car. I had another concussion. Yeah. And in that the accident, they took an MRI and found I had a brain tumor. Oh, my goodness. And so, and everybody's questioning, am I going to come back? I took my book, I held it up, and I did my Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah. And I said, I'll be back. All right. With an Irish accent. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I think the moral of this story is you should never be allowed to drive a car. That's right. <laughs> and then in 2010, I was sitting in my zero gravity chairs, if you've ever had them, they're wonderful. But the hinge snapped, I flipped back and had another concussion. Goodness and again, me. using all these methods that yeah. are in my book. Of, uh, and then in 2011, a penguin asked me to write a new, a new book called Coping with Concussion and Mild Traumatic Brain Injury. Now, t- during this period, before I'm going to go back a little bit, for those of your listeners who like spiritual suspense, while I was waiting to have my brain surgery, I wrote the novel, timeless who am i and you don't know who's alive or dead and it is partly you know here and there so that's also on my website so it's a spiritual suspense you don't know who's alive or dead and then as i said came in 2013 came coping with concussion and mild traumatic brain injury yes and then things were rolling along really nicely and and i'm going to go back a little bit in uh at 9-11, yeah. when uh, we had, it, it, I, in Boston, all the planes were canceled. Yeah. And using the Callahan technique, using uh-huh. TFT, I'm part of the Red Cross Disaster Relief Network. Right. And I was at Logan Airport for those pilots and flight attendants who didn't want to come on to the plane. And right. so I went there using the tapping that you know about. And within 15 minutes, all the flight attendants and pilots, and it was a very traumatic feeling walking in and seeing the clothing of the people who had just been killed in the 
you know, t Twin Towers. Yes, I bet. So then we move ahead, going back to now. In 2014, I had a pain in my armpit. Right. And I said, well, my, I know that pain means a gallbladder attack. My mother's had a gallbladder attack. I'm going to assume that. And I went and had an uh, ultrasound, and they said, you have uh, a brain tumor. Uh. And is that, and they said, you know, you, I knew about the brain tumor, but they went on my liver, and they said, you have, we think you have liver cancer. You need to be seen immediately. Goodness well, goodness. I dismissed it saying I've had hemangiomas, I didn't think it was. So in 2016, I went and finally had a biopsy, only to find I had a three centimeter tumor called primary hepatic lymphoma. Right. He says the rarest, 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 and on it, it had Hodgkin's, non-Hodgkin's, B cells and T cells. Wow. They told me if I didn't do chemo, I was gonna be dead in six months. Yeah. And using the hypnosis that I've been trained in, because I've been, uh, used hypnosis for many of my patients to heal many of the physical. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Is that as of the good news, as of this January, it has totally disappeared. Wow, well done. But the bad news is it's metastasized. Wow. And now I have a tumor on my liver, I have it on my lung, and I have it on uh, in my lymph nodes. Wow. And what my doctor turned to me and said, and I quote, okay, I see this now, I'll see you in the fall and go do your magic. <laughs> well, fingers crossed. That's <laughs> but right. Not, but it's not magic. It's just no. A, and just so this approach. is where we're going to go back to is that the body. We have white blood cells. We have red blood cells. We have lymphs. We have all this to heal ourselves. If you yeah. cut yourself, the body is resilient. It wants to heal. Yeah. And when I talk about resilience, I, I usually take. I don't know if in the UK you have silly putty, but yes, you remember yeah. silly putty? Yeah, the same yes. sort of idea, yeah. You can stretch it, yeah. you can break it, but then you can it still bounces back. That's it. That's and exactly when I go right. give speeches, I always bring and give out silly putty. Yeah. Yeah. Because this is what we're talking about. Yeah. And it's natural. It's natural for us to bounce back. This is natural. It? And the bell-shaped curve, which we all know about, is that there's 25% over here for the sea biscuits of the world. They're going to fight. They're going to do. They're going to make it. Yeah. Then there's the 50% who wants others to help them. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. and then there's the other 25%. There is nothing you're going to do. I call them the whiners of the world. Yeah. You can give them all the right things. You can give them all the right pills. And they still don't get better. Yeah. And so even though the body, so even the body wants to heal, the mind wants to heal. Then we get the belief system. Yeah. And you know, you and I both know about the placebo effect. Absolutely. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. you can say to someone, I'm going to give this to you. You're going to get better. And that belief, you can say to someone, I'm going to give you this pill and your hair might fall out. Yeah. It's the problem and, with control groups, isn't it? And scientific right, experiments. They've done many, many yeah. control groups on this. Yeah. And the same thing, there's a new word out that I've learned in the last oh, three or four years is nocebo. And that's yes. a placebo, nocebo. And those are those people who they say, nothing's going to help me. No one's ever going to help me. And you know what? That's right. That's right. Yeah. And so even though we have this resilience, mm -hmm. part of their resiliency is not believing that they could ever get better. And, and, and it's... It's all it's oversimplified sometimes to the point where it becomes unbelievable. This idea of positive mental attitude, and of course it isn't positive mental attitude, but it is this idea of proper optimism. It's having a hopeful, pragmatic, realistic sense of purpose in the future, and yes. um, and then you know there's recent research that's showing people who have that live longer, but they live better lives as well. Right. Because you can you can live longer and be miserable, but it's about living longer and a better life with less illness with right. less. Of manifestations of illness as well. And we, and we all know the relative who wants a little longer to make everybody else miserable. Yeah, miserable, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, my job. <laughs> and so, yes, so, you know, really getting into how the bodies create, we create many times our own reality. You know, someone sitting there, as I was told, 
that I would never get better. I, I will give back further history on me. When I was in high school, okay, and back in that day, and they said to me, I didn't do well on the SATs, and they told me I wasn't college material. They said, you make a nice housewife, yeah. a nice volunteer, but don't plan to go to college. Uh, interesting. Because that was a belief system they had. Well, yeah. That wasn't my belief system. Yeah. And that's, again is how someone is seeing themselves or what they've been told. And that's fascinating, isn't it? And it's the way education's changed because actually people don't make those sorts of pronouncements in that way. Because actually, if you had a little less, I don't know what the phrase might be, spark, right, chutzpah, whatever you want to call it, but right. if you hadn't had that, which is nothing to do with resilience, but if you had accepted that judgment, that's what I'm saying. then you end up with that place, don't you? You end up being the sum total of the expectations that were given to you. Right. And, you know, when we see movies of people who have come from slavery, who come yeah. over on the boats, the immigrants, yeah. the people who've made it, is that is you have the resilience and the spark. And that's what I'm saying. That part of the bell-shaped curve, yeah. and I call them the sea biscuits, the gold medalists. Well, it's, what, isn't, isn't there recent research in the States that shows that most of the immigrants do better than this sort of American population, don't they? Because actually they've had to... I mean, if you think about some of the um, some of the top social media stars, like Gary Vaynerchuk and all those sort of people, are all immigrants. Right. You know, they they have this drive, the fight. They have the perspective also of having lived somewhere else. Well, the, uh, I, I can't think of his name right now. Uh, is the new candidate, the Democratic candidate, uh, who says, you know, his father he had nothing and he, mm -hmm. he come up yeah. with nothing. Yeah. Yes. You know what is that motivation, the resiliency, the, you know, that is the sea best. As a matter of fact, in my work, as I told you, as a sports psychologist, I have worked with Olympic athletes. Yeah. And I have seen, and, and not in all one, one group, it's been over time, where four of my patients have made it to the Olympics. And one makes this gold, one gets the bronze, one gets the silver, and one doesn't medal at all. And it was the the one who didn't medal actually was physically the better athlete, mm. but he didn't have that fire in the belly that That's I'm right. talking about. Yeah. Desire is so important. The desire that I'm going to make it, I'm going to do it. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because what we see at the moment is a, a real rise in things like anxiety and depression. Right. And, um, you know, that's the enemy of a lot of, resilience and a lot of ambition and potential and such like so maybe maybe we could unpack a little bit of the anxiety depression sort of to well, it the, the, one of the things that i really get into and when anybody calls me and this is perfect anxiety and depression are symptoms yeah I agree. they're not the cause yeah. and we'll take anxiety uh, what i say to people i'll give you two different analogies that i use the simple one when it's over the phone and then the one i use on my website but is that if you have a runny nose, that is a symptom. Yeah. You do have to address it. There's no question. Absolutely. That's anxiety. But what is the cause of it? Yeah. And going back to the runny nose, is it a allergy? Is it bacterial? Is it viral? Well, you don't give antibiotics if it is a viral. Exactly. And the same thing what we do is that, uh, and when I go even one step further here is, you, you know, you can see my office, is uh, on a cold day that we have the fireplace going. Now, yeah. if we have a woman who's in her late 40s, 50s, she's sweating. Yes. Is she sweating because it's hot in the room? She's got a fever. Is she having a hot flash? Is exactly. she having food poisoning? I can, diabetes, right? Yeah. You can go on because the body can only respond in a so very nice. limited way. Yeah. So knowing that when someone says, I have anxiety or they are depressed, yeah. are they depressed because uh, that they're really, their dog died, and that they're sad, they're really talking about bereavement and grief. Yes, that exactly. Yeah, so there's a lot of confusion between these areas, aren't there? Yes, and, and, and uh, the fact is you're going to have the same symptoms. I have a chart on my website of uh, the symptoms of post-concussion syndrome. I have the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, and then I have the symptoms of uh, uh, grieving, and then I have yes and no's. And certain them, yes, is, are you going to be anxious that your dog just died or your family member just died? Yes. But that doesn't mean that genetically you have an anxiety disorder. No. And how are you going to treat the difference, as I'm going back to the virus or the bacteria, is that some people coming in 
if they genetically, and you're going to get a laugh on this, and so will your listeners, I label all my patients by dogs. All right. All of them. Yeah. Yeah. You're, not the, you're, not the, you're not the first person I've met who does that, actually. That's very really? interesting that you should say that. Yeah, I did not know that because yeah. since for 40 years I've been doing this. Yeah. And there was a little kid who came in, and he had a concussion. And his symptom of his concussion was anxiety. Yeah. See, this is what people don't understand. You can have anxiety from a brain injury. Yeah. Or you can have a concussion because of, uh, you know, again, biochemicals. Or you can have anxiety because of trauma. Yeah. So this little boy came in specifically with uh, anxiety as a result of his concussion. Yeah. But I looked at him and I said, do you know what a chihuahua is? He says, yeah. And I said, do you know what a Newfoundland is? He said, kind of. I said, it's a big dog, but I said, it's very gentle. It is the least aggressive. And I said that the most anxious Newfoundland is still calmer than the calmest chihuahua. I said, you are an anxious chihuahua. And I said, and when I'm done, you will not have anxiety, but you'll still be a chihuahua. Yeah. And then this other woman came in and I said to her, I said, you're a Jack Russell. She said, I got four of them at home. Interesting. People don't understand that when we look at development, you're looking at the parenting, yes. you're looking at the child's own personality, you're looking at the environment, right? And then you're looking at genetics yeah. and people don't look. And so is that if you come from a family that really has never been resilient, you know, yeah. you're, the answer is epigenic, isn't it? I mean, but it's a, that's a tougher thing. And, and I find today with the medical profession, and, you know, it's a tough profession and it's very fast, but specifically for things like stress and anxiety, the answer is, oh, with depression, the answer is always drugs or, right. or talking therapy. And, right. and nearly always, no, 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 let me rephrase that. On many occasions, they're just the wrong, they're oh, just the wrong treatments. I and would it, and it's such a shame because that makes things so much more difficult because people haven't been diagnosed by people that know something about this. That's a, that's a challenge, isn't it? And that's absolutely, and this is why I have this integrative team because what happened, there was a, a woman who at age 14 was put on antidepressants. She, they claim that her symptoms was depression. Yeah. Then she came to me because part of what I do, which we'll talk more about is neurofeedback and biofeedback yeah. and hypnosis. Yeah. And these are some of the things that really do help depression. However, it didn't work. I could see it. So on my team, I have an endocrinologist. I sent it to her. And son of a gun, this woman's symptoms of depression was from an amino acid imbalance. Once she got on amino acids, all her symptoms of depression went away. And that's the point that I get on, as you can already hear me getting on my soapbox, is that there was two young women who... Uh, have uh, they're on the spectrum autism and they had certain symptoms and nobody they should they went to the psychologist they went to yeah. the medical doctors they went to the educators and they said if you only learn this way and they did all these things we did neurofeedback and it's helping yeah. but they went to our endocrinologist and voila they had a b12 in balance and it's that fascinating because if you think about the um the serotonin issue with depression yes. and you know the classic thing is to give a, an ssri which is a right. serotonin thing but actually serotonin is produced by the gut on the whole and right. then and then you look at the diet and you see that most people who are depressed often are the people who are looking after themselves least well their diet's all out of whack their exercise is all out of whack and then you wonder why they're depressed because that can be even if it's even if it's not the main cause a real contributory factor can't it a matter of fact, I would like you to know, uh, I have my brain diet, and it's not a diet. No. Okay. And I have recipes. But what I have found over the years, okay, personally, this is how I found out. I learned a long time ago I had certain uh, food allergies. And when they, I had the food allergy, they put me on a six-month elimination diet. Yeah. And son of a gun, I found out what foods I was aller allergic to. Yeah. When this brain injury came to me, I noticed that certain times that when I ate certain foods, my ability, the brain fog would come in yeah. or you know, the emotionality would come in. So from it, I then did a brain diet. I've developed a, a elimination diet. Yeah. And basically what I am, again, we're on uh, this podcast, but I'm going to be a little bit gross. As I say to my patients, 
have you ever seen anyone shit face drunk? And they say, yeah. And I say, and then we list every single symptom of post-concussion. And guess what? Person who is shit face drunk has every single Every single one, they have the slurred speech. They have yeah, the gait. Yeah. They can't remember. They, they, they say, oh, you know, they look at you. They don't sleep well. They're, they can be aggressive, anger, yeah. right? Yeah, and absolutely. so what I, so what I do is I have them, we take a list of um, foods that can be made into alcohol. For example, sugar. Now, everybody talks about sugar, but sugar is rum, can be made into rum. Yes, that's true. Well, sugar can be made into lots of lots of lovely things, can't it? Rum is true. Cane sugar, yeah. See, is that apples? Like right now, it's the apple season here. That can be made into hard cider. That's yeah. liquor. Yeah. Corn is whiskey. Yeah. Rice is sake. White potatoes is vodka. Yeah. Oats, wheat, barley, and rye. We don't have to tell you it's bear time, and right yeah. uh, Oktoberfest. Yeah. And. So if certain foods they don't realize can be made. So what we do is we have them eliminate all those foods that possibly can make, be made into a, and then I don't have to tell you artificial sweeteners because it's Absolutely. bad. Just that's it. And sugar alcohols, because that's the new naughty thing that they're sn- sneaking into um, food at the moment. Even oh, worse. absolutely. Yeah. And maple syrup, I didn't know because up in New England here, coming from Ohio, we didn't have maple trees, is not that made maple syrup, I mean is that I didn't know you can make an alcohol into that. So oh, yeah. honey, honey yeah. is, think of the oldest alcohol as mead. That's right. Right. And so what we do is we have them eliminate this foods and then look at their symptoms. And this is not just for brain injury, but we also do it with, you asked about anxiety, but again, why is that person having anxiety? If they've been, they might've been in an auto accident years ago or had a mild stroke and they don't realize it. Yeah. And not every doctor does MRIs. And then we'll get into the type of MRIs in a moment. But is that by just changing the diet, uh, you know, is clearly that they found, I have one kid who could eat the apples. Another person soon, uh, well, the obvious, another one, grapes. What does yeah. grapes make? Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. See what I'm saying? Yeah. And is that, so when you start to eat these foods and you see that, now you're not as you're more fatigued if you're more anxious if are you feeling more depressed are you uh, your gates off you're slurring your speech you're having these things you're the, then that's a no-brainer i say to people don't eat it i wonder how many people um really do keep a food diet when they're experiencing these things um and like you say have a look at these different areas um, because it's the simplest thing you can take along to your doctor, isn't it? Right. Um, who's who's actually enlightened enough to be interested? Um, oh, and most doctors, I don't know about the UK, but over here, uh, nutrition is still not known. Well, the trouble with nutrition over here and the trouble with a lot of this whole, this area of science is that it's such a, it's such a um, flaky area of scientific research because it's built on food diaries and such like and, and some That's of the right. new thinking people like uh, dr michael mosley over here who have really worked at the nutrition oh yeah they're, they're doing proper work you know the, the proper control groups and blind control groups and placebos and proper you know physiological measurements and such like and you know even today quite recently i think it's today yesterday in the uk there was a report saying it's okay to eat bacon you can eat as much as you like and that flies us in the face of everything we've known about cancer in the last 30 years you know but one report and then suddenly let's rush right. out and I eat mean, bacon wait, wait, what was it remember how many what 10 years ago the low-fat diet oh yeah and, you know and now for my cancer i'm to be eating lots of avocados yeah. so <laughs> yeah, ketogenic stuff so all, all for all for cancer isn't it yes and going back to working in a business and organizations if somebody is eating something that is now causing them to go into an anger symptom. Yeah, that's right. And now they go into the room and someone says something and now they're more edgy because they either had their tweaky, you know, don't forget, if you remember how many years ago there was on the news that someone said he killed everybody because he had Twinkies. Yes, yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Well, all you need, all you need is very, very poor sleep and L-tyrosine. And, um, right. and then you've got that terrible thing about, um, being manic almost and completely tired and so your ability to control yourself is absolutely right. shattered, isn't it? It's not that you actually have to have alcohol or no. realize 
And then going back to the genetics again. Exactly. Some people having more sugar can cause them, you know, to react, be more reactive. Yeah. And, it, and now they get more irritable and now they go into the work and their boss tells them to do such and such. And then they take the gun and they shoot the bug. Yes. Yes. So <laughs> that's the extremes in reality. Um, okay, so that's that's very interesting. So you've you've written a very um, I'll say that in a way that's it's, it's fascinating actually. I'm just there's so much we could talk about, and I'm just I'm conscious of being respectful of your time. I know you've written a book which is on your website about um, coping with concussion and mild traumatic brain injury. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that because that's perhaps a way that some people can engage well, with some of yes. your ideas. For every single symptom of a concussion is in my book. So you have the physical, which is the, the number one is fatigue, and then the headaches, and then, you know, and all the different sleep problems. Then there's the cognitive issues, and then the emotional issues. And then for each chapter, such as fatigue, there is a little vignette, a little story of a real person, and then how is it diagnosed? And then the treatments are in three different ways, more for, I would say, the U.S. than uh, the world, but it's still, one is conventional, meaning that someone, uh, most doctors know about it, and it's covered by insurance, yeah. okay, which is pills. Okay, okay, is that the next is complementary, neurofeedback, uh, rate, uh, acupuncture, hypnosis is considered a complementary method. Yeah. Now, when you get the alternative methods, which is Reiki, you know, and some of the Qigong, or the tapping goes in and out on that, depending on yeah. insurance company. Yeah. But, and then homeopathics. So for every single symptom, there's uh, treatments for conventional, complementary, alternative, and then a practical suggestion of maybe going to bed a little earlier. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. then... Lifestyle. And then resources, and then giving books and things that they can do. So for every single symptom, for sleep, every single chapter, have the whole one of the chapters that I really stress on uh, is in the book is on grieving the loss of self because people don't realize that you know if you're thinking and now you can't, you've lost you, you've lost. Because yes. yeah. when I say to people that when my son, when my house burnt, the, uh, I was pregnant. I could count on me. Yeah. My son, one son had medical conditions. I can count on me. When the person I lost was me. Yeah. And that was devastating. Yeah. And so I had to find me again. And I had to grieve me. Yeah. And so that's dealing in the book too. Also, how to pick your barrister, you know, or your lawyer, you know, how to pick the right doctors. And knowing now, one of the things that's in the book, that um, the new book, especially, is that when people, and I've seen, because I'm on the Facebook from the UK and for concussions and stuff, you know, uh, and stroke, if you're in an accident and a typical MRI or a CAT scan will not show a brain injury, you right. have to have a single weighted imagery. And this is in my book. So I've written that if someone has been injured, what are the different types, the causes in the brain, and then how neurofeedback can help and to know that that many of these techniques can be done locally nationally internationally and so how we can work with that so the and i'm just i'm just checking amazon.co.uk i know i know your books on amazon.com but just as we're chatting there i've just noticed it in amazon.co.uk so people can get it there as well right so Absolutely. it's uh, it's called coping with concussion and mild traumatic brain injury, brain injury. and, it, and uh, the, the President of the American Brain Injury Association, Susan Connor says, and refers to my book as the encyclopedia. It has, which you're looking up, as I said, if you're looking up a headache, there's different types of headaches. There's tension headaches, there's migraines. And then specifically, there's a little vignette, again, how, and then all the treatments for, let's say, a migraine versus a cluster headache. Yeah. So for each one has the conventional, complementary alternative and practical suggestions now that's very interesting because there, there are a lot of people with cluster headaches who of course yeah. could have actually mild concussion but never that's right never link the two things together absolutely and the biggest thing i'm going to you know before we finish i'm going to really stress for your audience i'm very passionate in telling people and this is why i didn't do chemo anesthesia mm. anesthesia 
You go in for a for your dental, for your knee, for whatever. And gen, uh, general anesthesia for a person who's had no brain injury, no other issue, causes cognitive impairment from one day to six weeks. That's yeah. a fact. You That's can true. ask any any medical doctor. Yeah. Ask them. Yeah, and the physical fact, and physical um, impairment for a week. Right. Because everybody knows the sen that sensation of having been... As a matter of fact, your doctor yeah. says, don't drive home, have yeah. someone else drive you. Exactly. Chemotherapy will cause cognitive impairment from six weeks to six months. Yeah. It's called chemo brain. Yeah. If you've had a stroke, Parkinson's, a concussion, you are almost guaranteeing yourself dementia. Yeah. Because it, it plays on that cognitive impairment. Now, are there methods and foods? Yes. The, the neurofeedback kind of works. There's new, there's the newest form is being researched right now. It's called Violite. And they're doing the research like you're talking about that's <laughs> going to get FDA approved for using the specific, it's a photomodulation. It's actually light therapy. It's a different form of neurofeedback. Right. But the fact is, I say to people, like my one woman who came from Connecticut, she had had back surgery. She had a concussion. She had to have knee surgery, which is no question. So we worked with doing more local anesthesia. We did hypnosis, and we did a, a very, and not the typical general uh, yeah, anesthesia. She had no side effect of cognitive yes. impairment. Yes. So that's what I'm saying. I'm not telling people not to do. No. But is Choices. That, you need to yeah. educate yourself. I mean, we, we have... Um, I'm a hypnotherapist as well as you, as indeed you are. And, um, you know, you have people now, it's not something I'd ever do, but you have people who solely go into operations with using hypnotherapy, hypnosis. I, I have done you that. Have people, and you have people who have hypnogastro fans and hypnobirths. And I mean, you know, I'm not a woman, but I imagine having a you know, 10 pound thing one. pushed out of your body must be quite painful. I just want to tell you, that was my baby. Yeah. Before my brain injury, and I'm all doing puns here, uh, is that... I invented uh, the pain control uh, childbirth. It was in, in 1982. I presented in Canada at the 10th International Conference on Hypnosis. Oh and it, I, it was published. And what happened is that in 1990, and it was going to go international, is I did all the research, presented at this international conference. And in 1990, I had my, my accident. And this other woman took it over and it's now called hypnobirthing. So when you just mentioned that, yeah. that was from my work and my Absolutely. research that, at that international conference. Well, Dr. Diane, you and I, I reckon could chat for a week. And I'm I very, very, and I'm, I'm very want to be very respectful of your time. And I just want to say, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Your website is drdiane.com. So that's D-R-D-I-A-N-E.com. And as I said, the book's available both on Amazon.com and Amazon.co.uk. Uh, we've definitely had a flavor of what you do. And and I want to make one more uh, point is yeah. that I do, I work locally, nationally, and internationally. I've worked yeah. with uh, my patient who had Parkinson's. I worked from in London. I've had cancer patients. I've had childbirth patients. I can do hypnosis over Zoom. Yeah, so too right. I, absolutely. I, I totally work. agree. We okay. must, I, whatever happens, you and I are going to talk again. But for, okay. for today, thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. Thanks for listening today. You can go to our site, qedod.com forward slash podcasts and subscribe to hear other titles in our series. Or you can contact us at info at qedod.com to hear and find out more about tough love, leadership, accountability, resilience and burnout. You can go to our site, qedod.com forward slash burnout 2019 to hear and get access to a load of resources to help you manage and fight burnout. And you can go to qedod.com forward slash free ebook to hear more about the fundamentals of resilience. Until the next episode, keep on thriving.